Hey there, and welcome back to the second devlog from a game that still doesn't have a name yet. In the last one, we got the basics of movement and combat down with walking, dashing, blocking, and attacking. So in this one, we're going to continue with some more basic player controls and implement the game's various items. There's going to be a lot to cover in this one, so let's just dive right into it. The first item I wanted to work on was my game's version of Zelda's bow and arrow, which is actually an old-timey pirate pistol, because pirates and pistols are fun, it'll fit the story better, and also just to spice things up and make it feel different from the classic bow and arrow we've already seen done before. A driving force in a lot of my design with this game is that I should try to do things differently than my inspirations, at least to a reasonable degree. Doing things only for the sake of being different is often a recipe for disaster, but in general anything that can be done to both improve my game and make it feel different from the games that inspired it is something that should definitely be done, as my game doesn't really have the right to exist if it's just a clone of other games and does nothing to improve or set itself apart. That tangent aside, the pistol isn't actually the first item you would get in the game, but I wanted to work on it first, as it's just a basic projectile which is easy and something I've actually programmed many times before, and a lot of the other items are also projectiles, or at least they would be similar enough from a programming standpoint to make the pistol code the perfect place to start and lay the foundation for a lot of the other items. The basics of item usage here are that I add an item 1 and item 2 string is you can have two items equipped at a time, and when you press the correlating button it does a switch statement using that string. If you don't really know much about programming, a switch statement is basically a thing where you tell it to check a certain variable and then define what it should do depending on what that variable is equal to. I love them a lot as they're really easy to organize, and to my understanding they're a lot better optimized than just slapping a bunch of if statements all over the place. So in the case of my game, when you press either of the item buttons, first it checks what you have equipped in that slot, and if for example I have like the pistol set as item 1, it would then do whatever I've written under where it says pistol. Which in the case of the pistol, it then does another switch statement to check what direction I'm facing so it knows where the bullet should shoot out of, and then it just instantiates it there and adds force so it flies off. Also, there would usually be some sort of correlating player state to put them in, for example shooting when you use the pistol. I really wish I could have let the player equip more than just two items at once, like three or even the elusive four like in the Wii version of Twilight Princess, but there's not really a good way I could have gotten that working with my game's controls, as the face buttons are all used and L is planned for a map like in Hollow Knight and R is for the shield. That only leaves L2, R2, ZR, ZL, L, Trigger, R, you get the idea. I actually had really mixed feelings about using these buttons way back when I made the prototype, but I've since come around and now I'm glad it turned out this way as it opens the door for some fun mechanics I'll talk about right now. The next item I worked on was basically just a version of the fire rod, but not the classic fire rod from A Link to the Past, and also not the fire rod as it was in Hyrule Warriors. Mine works like the one from Four Swords Adventures. There's a difference? There is a difference. In all the other ones, and in this one too, when you press the button, it shoots out a fireball. Fun stuff. However, where Four Swords Adventures goes a step above the rest is that if you hold that button down, it instead starts spewing out flames like a flamethrower. Holding the same item button down for a different result is a really good extra form of interaction I'm kind of shocked hasn't been utilized in other ways, and is exactly the extra functionality I was talking about that using L and R2 for items would afford me. In order for this to work, I had to add an extra input for the player letting go of the item buttons instead of just pressing them, as in order for the system of pressing the button versus holding it to work, I decided that it would be best to start a timer when the player presses the button, so that if the player releases it before the timer is high enough, it just shoots like normal. But if the player holds the button down long enough and the timer reaches that point, it goes on to the extra hold function, which in the case of this fire rod type item is basically a flamethrower. Fun fact, I'm fairly certain From Software does this in most of their games too, as if you pay close attention, you don't actually roll until you let go of the button, as the roll and run buttons are the same, so I'm pretty sure they do the same thing, though I'm not positive. I don't work at From Software, I'm not that good. I remember getting this to work well, honestly being a bit harder than expected, but eventually I got it, implemented functionality with it so the fire staff works, and it either shoots the ball or spews a flame, and of course I also added a spell casting state for it to put the player in. I feel like using L and R2 lends itself really well to the whole holding the button down thing, as it frees up your thumbs to still use the sticks and d-pad, which is good because you can still move albeit slowly while using the flamethrower, and although I hadn't implemented it at this point, nowadays you can also change the direction you're aiming with the right stick, which wouldn't really be possible if your right thumb was busy holding a button down. After this I moved on to what I'm for now just referring to as the boomerang, though it's not actually a boomerang, I'm envisioning more some cross-bladed thing of death, like whatever these big shuriken things are called. And it's also mechanically different from a typical boomerang in a pretty big way. This one's actually remote controlled. This was sort of a thing in the DS games, which is where I got the idea, only instead of drawing the path with the touchscreen, you just remotely tell it what direction to go. It wouldn't really make sense for it to be able to stop, as it should be spinning in perpetual motion, and it would look kind of stupid just spinning there, so it works kind of like a worm, I think it's called? 
You can never stop it, but you can change the direction it'll go, leading to some potentially pretty fun situations having to navigate it through tight spaces and around obstacles, or even not in tight situations. For some reason, I feel like it'd just generally be more fun this way, maybe because it feels like more something you have to master and get the hang of, I don't know. I achieved this much like the other projectiles, checking which direction you're facing, then shooting it that way, but instead of the shooting state, it puts the player in the remote controlling state, wherein they can't move, and instead pressing the buttons tells the boomerang to change the direction it should move. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to just have the game tell the boomerang directly to move instead of telling the player to then tell the boomerang to move, and I'll probably change it to work that way later down the line, but for now it's working fine, and it's pretty fun to play around with. Also, if you press the item button while the boomerang is out, it would return to the player and in turn return the player to the idle state so they can move on. The same happens if it collides with anything, or at least we're gonna pretend it does. For some reason, I haven't actually programmed this yet. Next up is a personal favorite of mine that was also present in the prototype, the Hand of Ki-Ra, named in honor of the world's biggest hand fan. It's kind of like my game's version of the hookshot from Zelda, but it's pretty different because instead of extending to latch onto stuff and pulling them towards you or vice versa, this one shoots out a projectile that grabs the object and swaps you in the object's positions. Funnily enough, this idea was actually born out of a lack of competence, as in a much older project where I tried to recreate some Zelda stuff as a learning experience, I wasn't knowledgeable enough then to know how to get the chain with hookshot to extend, so my solution was to just shoot it like a projectile. This got me thinking about the implications of using a projectile instead, and that led me down the rabbit hole of coming up with this item. Since it also moves the other object to a spot you decide, now it can double not only as a way of getting around, but also moving other stuff to the right spot, for example weighing down a button with a heavy object. And since it's already a projectile, why not make it a magic one? Now it can go through thin walls. And for that matter, since it's not physically attached to the player, it doesn't make much sense to not let the player move after shooting it, so why not let them move around while it's out? Now that opens the door for puzzles where you have to shoot from the right angle and race against the hand to get where you want it to teleport the object to. Now this is getting pretty interesting, but wait, since there's so much freedom in how you're able to use it, it's also pretty easy to get trapped if you mess up, and that's no good. This was actually a pretty big problem in the prototype, to such an extent that I actually had to put a secret tunnel in this one spot that was a little too easy to get stuck in, as I did know the solution to the problem, but I was too lazy to program it for the prototype, though it is pretty easy and honestly a pretty great solution, I think. Just make the hand remember the last object it swapped you with. Now you and that object will basically be linked until you swap with another object, so if you hold the button down using that pressing versus holding thing we implemented earlier, the hand won't shoot out but will instead swap you in the previous object again. Not only does this solve the problem of the player potentially getting trapped, but now this opens up even more potential for puzzles. For example, you could have a block to weigh a button down with, but the button is in a spot where you couldn't feasibly just shoot the block from and or shoot and then run in to get in position, so the solution would be to shoot at the block to link to it, then make your way to the button and then hold down the item button to swap position from there. The way could even be blocked by something that requires the use of another item, meaning that the puzzle would require you to use the hand in conjunction with something else, and getting your game's mechanics to work together synergistically like that is really good. The hand was relatively easy to program, and also used the basic code from the pistol again, in that it checks what direction you're facing and then shoots the hand out from the right spot based on that. When it collides with an object that can be teleported, it makes a note of the object in question as well as the positions of both it and the player so that it can switch them and then the hand deletes itself. I also added a game object variable to the player script to keep track of the last object you swap with so that you can easily swap with it again when you hold down the button. I'll still have to be careful when designing puzzles to be extra sure the player can't be trapped and softlock themselves, but overall aside from a lack of animations or sound effects, I think the hand is working pretty great. Up next we have one of the coolest items, and one that if I'm being honest would be a pretty massive pain in the ass to implement. A clock that stops time. Not just time for a specific object, though that is really fun, I mean a clock that stops time for everything except the player. My first thought is that this would be easy to program, since you can just stop time in Unity by setting the time scale to zero. Done. And yeah, sure, I bet a better programmer might be able to get that working well, but I imagine that's not the best way to go about doing it as it would create a mountain of problems. The biggest is obviously that the player would get frozen too, which I'm sure there's some way around, but I feel like stopping time altogether would create a lot of problems, mess with lots of animations and timers, and also prevent the item from actually functioning, as I intend for it to only be able to stop time for 5 seconds, both as it seems like a balanced amount of time to limit it to, but also as a nod to another time stop ability from a series that already somehow got referenced in this video. But if Unity's time is stopped, that kind of complicates having a timer to limit how long you can stop time for, so there's another thing to add to the list of reasons to not actually stop time. So if I can't actually stop time in order to stop time, how will I actually stop time with this item? It'll create an absurd amount of extra work, but it sounds pretty simple. I'll just create the illusion of stopping time. 
Instead of actually stopping time itself, I made a time stop script to add anything that would be affected by stop time, and when you use this item it looks for all of those scripts and tells them to perform their time stop function. What this would look like for, say, an enemy is that the player uses the item, it sees the enemy has the time stopper script, and it tells the enemy that time has stopped. And since I already have to give this enemy a state machine anyway, I just added a state that's something to the effect of is in stopped time. When the enemy is in this state, any timers it may have are paused, its velocity is set to zero, any animations it might have are paused, and for all intents and purposes, time itself is actually still flowing, but the enemy may as well be frozen in time, an illusion that's further sold by a black and white filter that's added to everything except the player, which honestly took me longer to get working than it should've, because I haven't used post-processing much. This seems like the best way for me to get this working, and there is the small benefit that since I have to make the enemy manually pretend to be frozen in time, this gives me more control over how they react to time stopping. I imagine it will be largely the same for pretty much everything in the game, just pause any animations and timers it may have and stop it from moving, but it's still nice to have up my sleeve should I ever need it. A small part of me considered scrapping this dungeon entirely, or even another one to make room for it, as this makes me have to make basically everything in the entire game account for time stopping, which will add a lot of work for something seemingly so small, but I just didn't have the heart to throw out any of the other dungeons or items, and if I can get this in its respective dungeon working as well as I imagine it, it'll be really good and I'd be a fool to throw it out. This is another reason I'm starting with getting the player fully functioning first, is if I were to put this or anything off until later when I actually really need to program it, I would have to go back through the entire game and make sure everything works well with it, which would just be terrible. So I feel like it's better to just get the player fully programmed and make sure everything actually works right as I go through and make it. There are two items I won't be covering in this video, one of which is intentional because I'm not sure I want to spoil it, and the other one I just kind of forgot to write down when I did it in my notes, so I'm not sure where to write it into the script, and also it might be better left unspoiled. So for now we're going to move on to the last item I have to program, which ironically is the first item the player would obtain, the Leaf Medallion, name pending. This is also an item that was in the prototype. When you use it, it transforms you into some kind of leaf mouse creature thing that can go through tunnels and under certain objects because it's small. This was actually inspired by the Morph Ball from Metroid, and I guess by extension other similar things like the chicken and guacamelee, and now that I think about it, it actually functions eerily similar to the mouse transformation in Shantae. Funnily enough, despite the series obviously being my biggest inspiration for this project, I actually somehow didn't realize for the longest time that there was already an entire Zelda game about this exact concept with Minish Cap. I was just like, huh, I bet some kind of Morph Ball item would work great in a Zelda game. It's weird they've never done that before, which is stupid because I've played Minish Cap, but yeah, well, this doesn't really dissuade me from wanting to put it in my game as it wasn't a dedicated item in Minish Cap, so you can only shrink it specific times, and truthfully, I'm not entirely sure why they did it that way, aside from maybe hardware limitation or something, but because of it, I feel like they only scratched the surface of what can be done with such an item, so I'm excited to see what I can get out of letting the player freely transform in my game. The code here is honestly pretty wonky, and I'll probably change it, but I implemented it by disabling the player object when you press the button and spawning a placeholder leaf prefab at the same position of the player, and then if you press the button again while you're a leaf, it does the opposite, getting rid of the leaf, re-enabling the player object, and moving it to where the leaf was. This is kind of needlessly complex, as you could just shrink the player's hitbox and make leaf animations on the player object, and I'll almost definitely change to doing that at some point, but for now in this very early stage of development and testing, I think it'll work fine. I realize this video is already pretty long, and I'm kind of dreading editing it, but there's one more thing I want to cover before I end this video. It's sort of the odd one out here, as this item isn't one that you equip, and is instead a key item in the background, but I also want to add something kind of like the rock's feather that lets you jump. I'm actually really happy to be able to say that, because for the longest time, trying to think of a way to program jumping in a top-down game really stumped me, until recently when I finally got around to playing Four Swords Adventures, and I noticed that the player's collision doesn't actually seem to move up with them, and appears to still be on the ground where the shadow is, and then it hit me that pulling off a jump on a top-down game would actually be pretty stupidly easy. Much like the time stop, the player doesn't have to actually jump, instead I can just create the illusion of them jumping by making the sprite move up when animating it outside of Unity, and then while the player is in the jumping state, just ignore the collision layer of pits and stuff that can be jumped over. That way the player would look as though they're jumping, but the object itself doesn't actually move up or have complicated collision to think about, which makes my life a lot easier. This is actually a trick I already accidentally did two years ago in a terrible game I made when I was just starting out and learning called The Legend of Lonk, because he's too ugly for me to call him Link. The bat enemy in that game does the same thing, it's not actually moving up or down, but when animating the individual frames, I moved them up and down to create the illusion of movement, so while I don't have any art assets yet to show you what this would look like in the context of my current game and jumping, it should at least sort of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. 
This is probably the least fully functioning thing right now as it mostly relies on animations and I don't have those right now, but for now I just made the object change color to indicate it's in the jumping state and ignore the collision. Oh, I somehow almost forgot, but I also wanted to add a longer jump for when you jump while dashing, sort of like the jumping in Souls games that aren't Elden Ring. If the player jumps in either the idle or walking state, it does a normal jump where they move at the same speed as usual and can move midair even if that doesn't really make sense in terms of physics, but if they jump while in the dashing state, it does a long jump where they maintain that velocity, but are also stuck jumping in that specific direction. I think having a second logger jump could have some pretty interesting applications. Also, I added a temporary slowdown at the end of it, which doesn't serve much function right now as there are no animations, but when there are animations, the player would roll at the end of it as a way of sort of slowing themselves down. I also mapped the jump to X on the PlayStation or A on the Xbox and Steam Deck and would probably switch it to A on the Switch as these buttons should always be the buttons you jump with, but these are also the buttons you should always interact with stuff with, like reading signs and talking to NPCs. So since they're the same button and I had to make it differentiate between which thing to do, I figured I'd lay down the basic foundation for the interaction system and talk about that real quick while I'm at it. This is actually something I've done before in an unfinished little Resident Evil clone I made as you'd have to be able to pick up ammo and items and stuff and it actually worked pretty surprisingly well so I'm just going to use that system as the basis of this game's interactions. In that game, I had some invisible triggers around the player and whenever an interactable object entered them it would make that the designated object to interact with when you press the button and then pressing the button would broadcast a message to that object to perform its interaction, kind of like how the clock tells objects to get frozen in time in this game. This system worked pretty well and I'm pretty sure there's not anything wrong with the invisible boxes here like there was with my prototypes attacks since these boxes don't have to be repeatedly spawned in but both to test myself and because I think it would probably work a little better and just be cleaner I decided to convert this to drawing circles like the new melee attack method from the last video. Now when you press the button, first it draws a circle at a point dependent on the direction you're facing and looks for any objects that can be interacted with and then makes one of those the designated object to interact with. For some reason I used a for each loop because I basically just copy and pasted the attack code, but now that I understand how it works a lot better, I definitely need to fix that and just make the first object it finds the one it should interact with. This wouldn't really make a difference in terms of the player experience, but it's cleaner and I imagine it would be a lot more optimized, so I'll add that to my to-do list. Actually, you know what, I'll just do it right now. Cool. Anyway, after it looks for and potentially sets an object to interact with, if there's an object to interact with, it'll tell that object to do its interaction and just stop there, but if there's no object, then the player will jump. Though, if they're already dashing, it'll just skip all that stuff and go straight into jumping, as it would kind of be weird to be able to talk to an NPC or read a sign while dashing. It sounds like having to check for all the interactable objects would cause a delay for the jump, but no, it just does it all instantly. Also, I tell the object to do its interaction instead of just doing it in the script, because the player script is already like 3,000 lines long, but also because it's more modular this way. This same basic code would work for reading a sign as well as talking to NPCs and even picking stuff up if I decide to make that a thing, as that's all up to the interacted object to do, the player just tells it to do it. Having covered all but two of the equipable items as well as jumping and basic interactions, this video has gone on way too long, so I think this is a good place to stop for now. Thank you so much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you join me again for the next one, where I'll go through and polish what I've worked on so far to make sure the controls feel good, as well as make a small test dungeon to implement some other basic mechanics like room transitions and to make sure everything's working alright. You can only do so much testing in an empty room, so I think it's a good idea to make a small test area. That'll still all be done with placeholder graphics, though with each passing day we come ever closer to finally having sprites. That'll be a glorious day indeed.